Who's there? Officer Bates, it was hanging right there. All right, so so you saw this mannequin in the dark. Now, right. You, you, you didn't turn the lights on. I didn't have to. You don't believe me, right? Well, I'm sure you saw what you saw. Hysterical woman. Hmm? Delusional talk show host. Ma'am, this isn't the first call we've had from you. Thank you, officer. Thanks for coming. I wish I could be more help. I'm sure. Good night. What is it, Della? Yeah, I know she's an old friend of yours. Oh? I'll come right over. Della, please stop apologizing. I was getting up in another three hours anyway. Glad I caught you at home. Guess what? I've heard your show on KCDM, usually a little later in the morning. Is somebody trying to gaslight you, Dr. Carlin? It appears so. First it was just uh, phone calls, hang-ups, uh, someone uh, prowling around outside. When did all this begin? About a month ago. Thanks, Tom. Did anybody else have a key to your house? No, but it wouldn't matter anyway, because I had the alarm on. I mean, uh, how could anybody get the code? Does the security company send your bills here or to the station? To my office at the station. Anyone at the station who might have done these things? Well, if, if I had to pick somebody, it would be Winslow Keane. And ever since uh, he bought the station, he's been trying to break my contract. <laughs> I wouldn't put this past him. Ken. Get in touch with Lou McIntyre first thing in the morning. We need a full security analysis of the house. We need to change all the locks. And tell him to put a monitor on the phone so we can tape any phone calls. Della, we'll wait two days, then we'll need a new unlisted telephone number. Now, Sheila, I'd like an excuse to meet Winslow Keene and a chance to observe everybody at the station. I think I can arrange that. ABDM Talk Radio. And now back to Fritz and Fred. Okay, my twisted legions. Don't everybody call at once, even though we're raffling off a date with Fred's girlfriend this morning. So here's the issue. The girlfriends of radio personalities and the listeners who want them. Is the caller there? Uh, this is Steve Fritz. Steve, my man. How much do you bid, Steve? Well, what's Fred's girl like? Ooh. All right, she's hot, she's good looking. She won't shut up, but just do what I do. You put a bag over her head. 
If I could interject here, Steve, she's a two-bagger, definitely. That's right. You use two bags in case one breaks. Uh, we'll give them the choice of paper or plastic. Thank you. Good morning, USA. This is Red, White, and Baby Blue Clark Hunter. And I'm ready to straighten out you and the country if you've got the guts to call me. Clark, you get a double salute from me on how you spoke out on that gun issue last week. Friend, I don't back out, back down, or back off. What's your question? How do you feel about all these women who expect to get top jobs whether they earn them or not? Here's what I have to say to these women. Listen to the real women's national anthem. I vote as the clouds on air do. I enjoy being a girl. You know what really ticks me off, Boomer? Oh, what's that, Bruce? All these guys, they make all this money playing football, you know, and then, and then like they don't play and say they're injured or something. How do you know they're really hurt, you know? Oh, come on, look, from, from Pop Warner to college football to the pros, over a million people a year get hurt playing football, and, and every pro is playing a little hurt to some extent. And I'll tell you what, if I, Boomer Kelly, hadn't been hurt, I'd still be out there making the big bucks rather than spending my lunch hour in here talking to people like you, huh? Good afternoon. In Tinseltown today, Maura Shears, star of the hit movie Vampire Love 2, was spotted shopping for clothes at Trendy Maternity. Are we expecting? And if so, who's the daddy? This is Judith Jansen. You're on the air. Hi, this is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. What's your question? For the past hour this afternoon, we've had the considerable pleasure of interviewing the eminent defense lawyer, Perry Mason. Before our time is up, Mr. Mason, I'd like to pose a legal question of my own. That is, if you will indulge me. Depends on the question. A man shoots his victim in the head. The victim survives, but is on life support. Two years later, the victim's family and physicians agree he's brain dead. They pull the plug. The victim dies. Now, my question is, is the man who shot him guilty of murder or attempted murder? That's a good question. I would hope so. In most states, if the victim dies more than a year and a day after the shooting, the proper charge is attempted murder. However, most prosecutors would disagree. The case would certainly cause controversy. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. Until tomorrow, everyone, this is Winslow Keene. Now stay tuned for Dr. Sheila Carlin, coming right up after these messages. Well, I think that went very well, Mr. Mason. Law is always worth discussing. I enjoyed that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now here is the uh, woman who persuaded me to have you on my show. Doctor, the studio is yours. I am, I'll be with you shortly, Mr. Mason. You'll excuse me, I've called a staff meeting. You'll be hearing about it. Are you aware that Dr. Carlin has had some disturbing occurrences at her home during the last month? I've heard about them. Probably someone who actually took her advice and lived to regret it. Any idea who that might be? No, but if I find out, I'll let you know. Good, Mr. Keene. Whoever it is, they will live to regret it. Goodbye, Mr. Mason. I'm making some significant changes. All right, Winslow. You've had your little moment of drama. Now, what's this all about? There's been a steady decline in revenue for the past six months, so I'm changing the station's format. Beginning Monday, KCDM will be playing music during the day, and you'll all be working at night. What? Oh, come on. Yes, Fritz and Fred, the bad boys of radio, will be dispensing their tastelessness from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. What? There is no way. Our morning drive time gets the highest ratings in this city. Nobody listens to KCDM at night. Hey, man, we've got an offer from L.A. We're going. Believe me, you two aren't going anywhere. And you, Judith, you'll be purveying your mindless gossip from 10.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., from 3.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., and 11.30 p.m. to midnight. Live. Well, that's a 14-hour day. I couldn't possibly work those hours. Pity. And you, you'll be mispronouncing the names of Major League cities from 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. You can't do this to me. Let's face it, Boomer, I just did. You're a charity case. 
What other station in town will hire you? And you, my pseudo-intellectual friend, will wrap yourself in the flag from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. I see how this works. You're saving the best hours for yourself. Well, that's true. Well, I'm calling my lawyer. <laughs> and the first thing I'll ask you is how you intend to pay him when I cancel your contract. Your contract stipulates you can't work anywhere else for the next 27 months. Well, we'll just see about that. And when Dr. Carlin gets off the air, you can tell her she's going on the air from midnight to 3 a.m. Anyone still up at that hour deserves her one-minute psychiatric evaluation. See you later, bad boys. This is Dr. Sheila Carlin inviting you to share your problems with me. And together we will find the solutions that can empower you and change your life. Until tomorrow. Oh. Jack, you did it again. See you tomorrow, Doc. Okay. Judith, why are you still here? I just wanted to see your face when I gave you the news. Wait a minute. Wait, wait just a second. I don't care who owns this station. You cannot do this to my show. But I can, and I will. But I won't let you treat me this way. No, what I like most about you, Dr. Carlin, what is, is how seriously you take yourself. Oh. As if any of your psychobabble actually helps anybody. Will you shut up, Winslow? If you had any competence, your own daughter would still be alive. <laughs> Read the fine print, Doctor. I own the station, I own your contract, and I own you. Excuse me. Hey, Phil. Hey, Boomer. Good. Who do you like on Sunday? And the cheerleaders, huh? <laughs> Chris Scanlon. Right here, Boomer. Got the back room for you and your friends. Great, great. Thanks, Dave. Ah, oh, shabby chic. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa's murder was planned here, you know. Oh, really? By whom? This is Mr. Farnsworth. I'll see you're not disturbed. So what do you nice folks have in mind? I'm sorry to say that Keen is right, Sheila. Under the terms of this contract, you're tied to the station for the next three years. Well, I wish you'd been my lawyer then, Perry. Well, I wouldn't have let you sign these. How could I let myself in for this? Don't be so hard on yourself, Sheila. You just lost your daughter. Your husband was divorcing you, and you, you weren't thinking clearly. I wasn't thinking at all. I've counseled people whose children have died of a drug overdose. When it's your own daughter, it, it's, it's different. I did blame myself. And then when Tom blamed me, too, I... I was lost. You certainly had good reason to be lost. Perry, considering the stress I was under, is this contract valid? I'm afraid it is, my dear. Sheila? I wish we could have been more help. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Nothing we can do? Nope. Not this time.
Turner. You out? Yeah. Let's go. You said 15. That's no discount. 12. Okay. Wallace? Drive carefully. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. Consider it done. Well, just leave it out there by the door. I'm sorry, but I, I need your signature. I'm sorry, sir, but I need your signature for these. Come on in. Thank you. Who, uh, who sent this? They're from someone who wants you to get everything you deserve. Sheila Carlin, you're on the air. Listen carefully. I can only say that I'm stunned at both your lack of compassion and your stupidity. And furthermore, your audacity in referring to what you do as constructive when any fool could see that. Winslow? Winslow? Oh, my God. Here. Over there. Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, hello. I'm I'm Dr. Sheila Carlin. I was on the air with Mr. Kane when this happened, and I got here as soon as I could. Who did this? Well, that's what we're trying to find out, uh, Doctor. Dr. Carlin, what kind of a car do you drive? A Jaguar. Mm -hmm. Why? And your license plate, what, what does it uh, read? Shrink. <laughs> it's my daughter's idea. And you're on the air. Are you on the air every night, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Midnight to three. Mm -hmm. And while you're on the air, do you... Dr. Carlin? Yes. While you're on the air, do you answer your own telephone calls? Well, I, I don't have an engineer at that hour, so I do handle it myself. Uh -huh. Why? May I ask, where were you earlier this evening? That is before you went to work. I was... Uh, I was at home. Mm -hmm. Alone. Alone? Why? At approximately 1.15 this morning, while you were on the air, you apparently talked with Winslow Keene, am I correct? Yes, I, I said that. I, I, he called me to rant at me, and uh, I heard the gunshot. I called 911. I got here as soon Listen as I... Ma'am, you called 911. Our first unit arrived here at 1.20. 
the medical examiner placed Mr. Kane's death at approximately 10 p.m. Now, you see where I'm going with this, ma'am? He was already dead when he called you. But that's... that's not possible. I think you better come downtown with me, ma'am. What? To police headquarters. Do you have an attorney? Can we go now? I'm afraid not yet. What? Dr. Carlin, do you recognize this tape recorder and tape? No. Why? We found it in your home. My home? We believe, ma'am, that at approximately 10 p.m., you shot and killed Winslow Keene. And then at 1.15 a.m., while you were on the air, you answered a call from Mr. Keene. It was Winslow Keene. The whole audience heard him. We believe you manufactured that call from a Winslow Keen broadcast, which, of course, would give you the perfect alibi. And we have here an automatic dialer programmed to call the station and to play the tape, which we found in our house, Mr. Mason. Listen carefully. I can only say that I'm stunned at both your lack of compassion and your stupidity. And furthermore... But, Carlin... Dr. Carlin, I am placing you under arrest for the murder of Winslow Keene. Lieutenant, I need some time with Dr. Carlin. Use my office, Mr. Mason. I swear to you, Perry, I don't know anything about this. Does anyone have access to your car? No. It must have been a car that was made to look like mine. Is that all they have on me? No, there's more. Lieutenant Brock's men found the murder weapon hidden in your basement. I didn't kill him, Perry. I hated the man, but I didn't do it. I know it looks bad. I... I'm being framed. I'm certain of it. One thing we can be certain of. It isn't Winslow Keene. What is that? That is a new herbal tea. Cypress. That's a tree. It was. This is going to relax you. I am relaxed. Well, this will make you more relaxed. You know a lot about witchcraft. <laughs> I'm on my way to see Sheila. From her, get the names and backgrounds of all persons at the station who might have had a reason to kill Keene. He was evidently making drastic changes. Evidently. Hello, Della. Have some tea. Goodbye, Della. Smells like tree bark. It is. What did you find? The murder weapon was a cold gun. No serial numbers, untraceable. Anybody could have bought it. I can check out some very shady types I know. You do that. I'll be careful. You be careful. Looking for something cold. I'll introduce you to my wife. You got references. Louis Castile, Steve Roma, Max Taylor. Okay. Take your pick, my friend. Looking for a desert eagle. I'll pay top dollar. Too bad you weren't here two days ago. I had one, but I sold it, but not for top dollar. Yeah, I got the locker key. Right? I'm checking out now. No, don't call me. I'll call you. Right.
Who is it? My name's Milansky. I'm an attorney. I just want to talk to you. Open the door. Open the door. So there's nothing you or anybody else can tell me these guys here. Okay. All right, the security guards didn't get a good look at this guy. Is there anything that you can tell me about him? Uh, I didn't get a good look at him either. But he's the man who killed Winslow Keene. Well, isn't that interesting when all of our evidence indicates that Dr. Sheila Carlin did it? The gun that killed Keene was the Desert Eagle. Very unusual. The man who attacked Ken tonight bought one two days ago. Ken trailed the guy, backed him into a corner. Don't forget, the guy robbed him. The guy we're chasing after bought the gun from a guy named Wallace. He runs the 8th Avenue pool hall. Oh, I know him. I'll talk to him, but he's not going to cop anything. Lieutenant, you want to take a look at this? Looks like about $100,000. Uh-huh. So that's why you're trying to get to that locket. That's where he kept a stash. I don't want a round-the-clock stick out in this place. When he comes back for the cash, that's when we'll nail him. When you do, Lieutenant... We'll have our killer. I can't go back there. They're going to have cops all over the warehouse. I know they're not going to be there forever, but I can't wait. You're going to have to get me more money. No, no, wait. Hey, you understand. This was your party. You're paying for it. Winslow Keene should have fired his gardener. Why don't I check around outside? Good idea. Good morning, Miss Jensen. Who are you? Name's Mason. I represent Sheila Carlin. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm looking for my glasses. Of course you are. Well, I came to visit Winslow a few days ago, and I just left my glasses. Now that he's dead, you're still looking for them. Oh, well, Winslow can't now, can he? Wasn't your visit with him the other day to discuss getting out of your contract? Well, uh, yes, it was. Look, I know how you operate, Mr. Mason, but I do have an alibi for the time of the murder. The person responsible for Keene's death doesn't need an alibi. It was a murder for hire. 
A hitman? Sounds colorful. So is what well-known radio gossip is being investigated by the FCC. Who told you that? It seems Keene informed the FCC that you had accepted cash for mentioning certain celebrities' products on your program. Well, that has never been proven. Oh, but if it is, you could face a jail sentence. Your career would be over. What exactly is your point, Mr. Mason? That you also had a motive for murder. That can't be proven either. Ah, my glasses. You would have thought Winslow would have had the decency to return them himself. Well, he can't now, can he? Uh, two nights before Winslow Keene died, you and four of your colleagues had a private meeting at a certain restaurant. Special occasion? It was just social. Why wasn't Sheila Carlin invited? Frankly, she's not that popular. Terrible temper, you know. Good luck with your case, Mr. Mason. No. Good luck with yours. That is a subpoena. We'll be delighted to see you in court. Hi. Who are you? My name's Smolansky. I'm a lawyer. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. It's not a good idea to startle me. Heard you coming, Bigfoot. I'm a cop. You're investigating Winslow Keene's murder? Not much to investigate. We got enough on Sheila Carlin to convict her twice. Except that Dr. Carlin didn't do it. Yeah, that's what you say. That's what I know. Well, there's no evidence here, but uh, look around. It'll keep you out of mischief. Find something? Just a cop with an attitude. What can I do for you? My name's Mason. My name's Molansky. We're representing Dr. Sheila Carlin. Oh, yeah. The shrink who popped that little guy. What's his name? Keen. Winslow Keen. Yeah, that one. I can't help you. I never saw either one in here. Boomer Kelly is a regular, isn't he? Yeah. Why? Mr. Kelly had a dinner party here last week. In the back room, all six of them. Kelly, Hunter, Moore, Fisher, and Jansen, that makes five. You did say six. One guy came late. Who was that? I don't know. Maybe you should ask Mr. Scanlon. Fred, I can't help you. I wasn't here that night. This gentleman seems to think that you were here. Don't you remember? I was home with the flu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's the matter with me? He's right. I'm sure he's always right. If you happen to remember the name of man number six, give us a call. Good luck with the case. No, good luck to you, Mr. Scanlon. That's the subpoena. I'd really like to know who man number six was. Well, they're not going to tell us. Heard from your gun dealer? He's ducking my calls, but he's usually there on Friday nights counting his receipts. Huh. Let's hope he's had a good week. That guy you sold the Desert Eagle to, has he been back here? I never should have talked to you in the first place. Now let me out of this. That gun killed Winslow Keene. Now if that guy calls here, you're going to call me. What's that? Expecting anyone? Uh-uh. Get back.
the guy who sold the gun to Keene's murderer. Yeah, well, for all I know, he's just the guy you play pool with. What were you doing following me? Look at it this way. If you are chasing a killer, you're going to need me. Because, baby, I had you cold in that pool hall without breaking a sweat. You do the legwork, and I'll take care of the bad guys. Oh, no. No, 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 no. You and I are not going to be buddies. See you around, lawyer. What do you heard? I could get killed talking to you. Look, this guy called again. He says he wants another piece. Well, he knows you can identify him. You better stay clear of him. Look, if if I give you a name, it's worth something, right? Because I got to get $10,000 to get lost. If it's the right name. Look, meet me in the pool hall in 30 minutes. And bring the money. Wait a second. That's not a good idea. order a lawyer. Did you order a lawyer, friend? Sure. Extra large. To go. Oh, would you hand me that right here? Another stunt? Stunt? What stunt? We like girls. No, you're you're right, Mr. Mason. We're, uh, we're giving away a harem. Thirty girls. Count them. Thirty. What can we do for you? Mr. Keene forced you into accepting an unfavorable time period for your radio show. Did that make you angry? Us? <laughs> angry? Going from drive time to dead time, why should we be upset? Your dinner at Scanlon's bar, you used it to discuss what to do about Keene? Nah, we were just hungry. Actually, it was a wine tasting. With three people you didn't like? <laughs> hey, we like everybody. Even you, but especially her. Yes, yeah. she could be a great companion. Now, I've been through Keene's files. He had signed contracts with everyone but the two of you. Now, why was that? Sloppy management. Or was it because he didn't need contracts? Did he threaten you with a certain videotape? A videotape of the two of you and several underage ladies? <laughs> what a great rumor. How many were there? Shut up, Fred. Look, there have been, uh, there have been groupies that throw... Keen them... was blackmailing you into staying with the station, wasn't he? Where'd you get that? What do you want from us? The name of man number six at that dinner? There were only five of us there. Consider this a gift. A video cassette and two subpoenas. Two. Perhaps I can jog your memory in court. Good night, Doc. Yeah, look at this. The three stooges go to Mars.
are you? Are you still following me? Did you lead me to something? You sure did. He was shooting at me. I didn't get a good look at him. Neither did I. But I uh, got to look at the woman in the car with him. Can you identify her? Oh, yeah. I grew up with her. Hope we can find her. Because I just hit a dead end. And by practicing what I preach, I hope that I can demonstrate that even the most negative situation can be a, an opportunity for personal growth. Um, I'm confident that you will always support me. Um, well, I'm ready to hear from you. You're on the air. Hello, Mr. Kelly. You're Sheila Carlin's lawyer, right? That's right. And she's got a lot of nerve. You know, she uh, murders Winslow Keene, then comes right back in here and does her own radio show. You didn't like the changes Winslow Keene made here at the station, did you, Mr. Kelly? Nobody did. In the history of your professional problems, you also had a history with Mr. Keene. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Mason. I heard that Winslow Keene was directly responsible for the end of your football career. In a restaurant five years ago, he approached you after a game you lost. You didn't like what he said about your performance. Look, I I've heard this before. It sounds like a broken record, and it's all nonsense. You hit him, knocked out his front teeth. Later, two men you couldn't or wouldn't identify caught you in a parking lot and broke your knees. Look, if Winslow Keene had done this to me, then why would he give me my own show? Maybe Mr. Keene liked owning you. Uh, owning me? Wait, owning me? Nobody owns me. That's why you put together that gathering at Scanlon's restaurant, right? To make sure nobody owns you? Look, I didn't do anything wrong, so you just stay away from me, okay? Is that a warning? That's my advice. Mr. Kelly... You had two very good reasons to hate Winslow Keene. For most killers, one is enough. Thank you, Dylan. Go on, Kent. Do you recognize the hitman's girlfriend, Dan? Kathy said they grew up in the same neighborhood together. The girlfriend's name is Doris Lester. She's a prostitute. Try it, Perry. Hot, um, hot, um... Uh... That's a very special tea. It's called Mystical Mixture. Let me know how you feel in an hour. I see Della's still trying to improve you. It's been a lot of years, but she never gives up. <clears throat> how about our other suspects? Well, I haven't talked to Mr. Hunter yet, but it could have been any one of them. What about that mysterious man number six? I'm not sure he had or has anything to do with the murder. You think they all got together and hired a hitman? I wouldn't rule it out. Kathy Paxton certainly has an interesting idea for catching our hitman. She's going undercover. Lieutenant Brock told me she's a very capable officer. Yeah, a real dynamo. Ken, for some of us, taking direction from a woman is a new experience. You've always handled it beautifully, Perry. Yes, haven't I? Well, where'd the department get this car? From a pimp. Where else? <laughs> I think you're right. If your old friend Doris is a prostitute, most likely the man with her is her pimp. Yeah, and our shooter. So how well did you know Doris, anyway? Uh, well enough. Her parents were drunks, and uh, her father had a thing for her. Life didn't give her a break. She didn't give herself one either. Oh, hey, there's Doris Pullover. Woo! There goes Doris with the John. 
Well, let's hope that's a quick romance. Evening, ladies. Look, this corner's taken. Oh, honey, I don't work on a corner no more. Used to, to my man over there setting me up in high style with the Taylor Arms. Well, then what are you doing here? <laughs> Making you an offer. 50-50 split with the man. Medical care and security on the premises. And none of my man's girls get knocked around. Huh? Yeah, well, we already got us a man looking after us. Yeah, and he wouldn't like us talking to you. So why don't you take a hike? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what? what? My man doesn't take no for an answer. Uh -huh. You're gonna like working for him. Hey, look, we don't want any trouble, then okay? Then don't give me any. Okay. Why don't you get lost? Be nice, uh, sweetie. Uh, We're gonna be friends. Uh, That's Clark. You can't ban books because they disagree with your politics. What about the First Amendment? Just what I'd expect from a limp whip like you, Junior. Upholding some subversive's right to promote treason under the guise of self-expression. You're history, pal. And for the rest of you late-night Bolsheviks out there, here's a medley of John Philip Sousa. Decent people sleep at night. Well, I get a cranks. People who don't agree with you. I call them the way I see them. You didn't just drop by to tell me you like my show. What can I do for you? No one present at the wine tasting at Scanlon seems to remember more than five people being there, do you? Matter of fact, I don't. How did you enjoy the wine? Why do you ask? Well, you are a reformed alcoholic. So? So, why were you there that night? Were you planning Mr. Keene's future? Winslow was a twerp. Why would I kill him? You still married Mr. Hunter? No. I'm divorced. I understand your wife is very beautiful and a very talented actress. You were considered a perfect couple. I don't care to discuss this. Do you mind telling me the reason for your divorce? That's none of your business. Three years ago, you discovered your wife was having an affair. Who told you that? The man who broke up your marriage was Winslow Keene. You threatened to kill him. But I didn't, did I, Mr. Mason? Life goes on. I got over it. No, you didn't, Mr. Hunter. No, you didn't. Why, you're still fighting the Cold War. You go. Gee. You're gonna love this place, baby. Wall to wall view. Well, I was just doing what the man told me, you know? Yeah. That's funny. Because I'm having a hard time believing that you are a working girl. Well, I'm not. I mean, you know, I wasn't. It just. Look, I got laid off a year ago, and I couldn't make my rent, you know? You heard it before. Yeah, I've heard it before. Many times. Look, 
I don't care who I work for. You know, the guy was just there, and I needed protection. Hey, look, I'll work for you if you treat me decent. You'll work for me, all right. As soon as I teach you my way. Lesson number one is discipline. Mm. I will be back. Harry, here. Let me guess. Saltwater crocodile. No, it's made from pine cone and it's good for the mine. Try it. It's awful. It's Chinese. Northern or southern? Northern. It's northern Chinese and it's awful. Sheila Carlin leave for court? I just spoke to her. She said she'd meet us there. Brock brought in all the hookers and talked to them. But they won't help. Why don't you wait in here in case she calls? Yeah. Ken. It's not your fault. Thanks, Perry. I wish I could believe that. Believe it. Trouble last night? Yeah. We got a new girl. Huh? Downstairs. In the basement? Sensory deprivation. to roust our quota of hookers. So let me go, and, and I'll forget this ever happened. This is no vice thing. Hey, why would I lie? That's a good question. Come here. Come on. Come on. Okay. We gotta get out of here. But she's gonna look hey, us. I think she's been looking for me. And now she's made me. Look, I'll be back in an hour. You pack up. Indoors? Let's get rid of her. Hey, I never said... Hey, hey. Hey, baby. Come on now. Come on. I want us to be in this together. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this handgun, which has previously been identified the murder weapon was found where in the basement of the defendant's home lieutenant i now show you an audio tape cassette mark people's exhibit number two and ask if you can identify it 
Yes, it has my mark on it, and it was found in the defendant's home, or Dr. Sheila Carlin. What can you tell us about this tape, Lieutenant? It's an edited tape of a Winslow Keene broadcast. Have you compared it with the transcript of a telephone call made to Dr. Carlin on her show the night of the murder? Yes, I have. That's Mr. Keene's half of the conversation. Could this tape machine and automatic dialer found in Dr. Carlin's home have been programmed to call the station that night and play this tape, Lieutenant? Yes, I personally programmed a test call to the station using that tape. I also examined telephone company records, which indicated a call had been made from Ms. Carlin's home to the station at 1.15 a.m. on the night of the murder. We previously had testimony that Mr. Keene's time of death was no later than 10.30 p.m., more than two hours earlier. <laughs> well, that is correct. The deceased couldn't have made the call. Then this tape and the call were just an attempt by the defendant to establish some kind of alibi. Objection. No foundation calls for improper opinion. Sustained. Nothing further. Thank you, Lieutenant. What was the name of that dog that used to follow you all over the neighborhood? Maxie, Moxie? Stop trying to pretend we were friends. We weren't ever friends. So we didn't hang out. But we knew each other. I knew what your father did to you. Shut up! Or what, you'll kill me twice? He can't even pull his own trigger. And you're ready to do life in prison for him? I'm not going to prison, okay? We're moving in on him, Doris. Get out before you go down with him. I can't. Oh, yeah, I forgot. He's your pimp. He uh, slaps you around. He takes your money. Why wouldn't you be loyal? You don't know anything. He loves me. Oh, yeah? Well, you better be crazy about him, Doris, because sooner or later you're going to die for him. It's a shame, too, because uh, I could cut you a deal. I'm strong. How long have you made deliveries for Morton Pharmacy? Um, about a year and a half. You've delivered prescriptions to Winslow Keene's house before the night in question? Uh, oh yeah, many times. Will you tell us what you saw on your last delivery to Winslow Keene's house? Um, sure. Um, I went there, same as always, and uh, I rang the bell and nobody answered. So I knocked and he still didn't answer. So I figured, you know, maybe he went someplace. Did Mr. Keene usually wait at home for his prescription deliveries? Oh, yeah, always. See, uh, he took Digitalis and so and can never remember, you know, to call until he ran out. Um, and so he was always very anxious to get it. But on this night, he did not answer the door. No. Then what happened? Well, I decided to go back to the store and uh, to have the pharmacist call him. And uh, I was just about ready to pull away when this car comes barreling out of Winslow Keene's driveway and damn near hits me, you know, driving away. You got a good look at the car? Oh, yeah. Up close and personal. Will you describe it for us? Sure. Um, it's a green Jag, and it had a license plate that read shrink, you know, S-H-R-A-N-K. One of a kind, would you say? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, aren't all license plates one of a kind? I have no further questions. Mr. Mason? Mr. Armstrong, is there anything else you remember about the car? Um, no, sir, not really. Your Honor, Defense Exhibit B. Mr. Armstrong, we show you a photograph which depicts the rear of Dr. Carlin's Jaguar. Is that the car you saw? Yep. I mean, you know, there's the license plate, shrink. What else do you see? Um, a bumper sticker in support of protecting dolphins. Now, you stated you saw the license plate up close and personal, but you never mentioned that bumper sticker. Why not? Well, um, I guess I didn't see it. Your Honor... 
What is the point of this? Your Honor, defense contends that whoever wanted to frame Sheila Carlin removed the license plate from her car and put it on another car, an identical Jaguar. But they overlooked the Save the Dolphins bumper sticker. Defense has no further need of this witness. Mr. Markham? I have no further questions. The witness is excused. Mr. Markham. Your Honor, the people rest. Mr. Mason, you may call your first witness. I call um, Nick Scanlon to the stand. Mr. Scanlon, on the night of the wine tasting arranged by Mr. Kelly, how many people were in attendance? I wouldn't know. Five, I guess. You don't know exactly? I wasn't feeling well, so I stayed home that night. You did not stop by your restaurant? No. Ask any of my employees. Oh, I have. I remind you that you are under oath and face the penalty of perjury. Now, I'll ask you once more. Were you at any time at your restaurant that evening? No. No? No further questions. Terry Mason's office. Where? Yeah, I got it. Who is this? I thought he was checking to make sure I was really dead. So what happened? I should have told Doris to kill me. Ah, I turned her around. How'd you turn her around? Come on, Boy Scout. Don't you know people in trouble are just looking for a way out? You gave her one. Ah, oh, yeah, but the first time in her life she actually took it. She also gave me the name of our shooter. Paul Turner. Lieutenant Brock couldn't find anyone under the name of Turner in their records that matches our guy. Did Brock, by any chance, send a fingerprint team to Doris's house? By chance he did, but they didn't find any clear prints. Everything was smudged. Thank you. The Department of Water and Power, the gas company, the papers, none of them have a listing on Paul Turner. Was this woman lying? I don't think so. All you can do now is wait and hope that Doris will contact you. Where are you going? I'm going to see if I can find some oysters. You all like oysters? These oysters are excellent. Thank you. You want anything else? The name of...
man number six. I told you. I don't know. I wasn't here. Aren't you curious as to why I called you to be a witness? The lawyers do strange things sometimes. True. But I wanted you to make a declaration under oath. What's this got to do with me? On the night of the alleged wine tasting, you placed a call on your private line from here to your brother in a Miami hospital. Here's a copy of your phone bill. Now, maybe now, you'd like to tell me about man number six. Where is he? Why the hell doesn't he call? Take it easy. Honey. Hey! Hey. Are you telling me what to do, huh? Are you? Uh, no, I'm just trying to be helpful. Hey. Yeah. Why haven't you called, huh? I got cops looking for me. What? Well, you double-crossing... Hey, don't... He hung up on me. He says that he can't get any more money. He says that Mason is on their case. He thinks he's going to get away with this. He's not. I may not get any more money, but I sure as hell can stop him from fingering me. Yes, indeed. Doris. The hell with you too. Yeah. Put her through. Kathy, it's me, Doris. Are you okay? It's Turner. He's gone crazy. Where is he? I don't know. He's gonna go kill whoever hired him to kill Winslow King. Up. Turner's on his way to the courthouse. Good afternoon, officer. Your Honor, I call Russell Farnsworth to the stand. State your name and occupation. Russell Farnsworth. I'm a private investigator. Mr. Farnsworth, on the night of the 10th, did you meet with five people in the back room of Scanlon's Oyster Bar? Yes, I did. Any of them in this courtroom? All of them. Would you point them out, please? Him. 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 And her. Will all of you please stand? Let the record show that Mr. Farnsworth has identified Fred Fisher, Fritz Moore, Boomer Kelly, Clark Hunter, and Judith Jensen. You may all sit down. Now, uh, who arranged this meeting? Mr. Kelly, then. The purpose? They offered me $50,000 to do what was ever necessary to get them out of their contracts with Winslow Keene. And you did that? No. They decided to grab the money and run. I mean, what are they going to do? Sue me? <laughs> uh, Winslow Keene was murdered two days after you took their money. Were you given a deadline to perform your services? 24 hours. 
So when you hadn't delivered on your promise, one of your employers could have made other arrangements. Objection. Speculation. Sustained. What did you do after your meeting? I went to the airport and flew to Vegas to find a missing husband. It took me three days, but I got him. And to prove I was there, I got receipts, airline ticket stubs, and a little cocktail waitress named Tiffany. Cost me a bundle. <laughs> no further questions. No questions. Witnesses excused. Thanks. Mr. Markham, permission to approach the bench? Granted. These five people had motive, opportunity, and the desire to inflict bodily harm on Winslow Keene. Your Honor, we still have the tape, the recorder, the automatic dialer, and the murder weapon. Mr. Markham, there were no fingerprints on any of those. Your Honor, they could have been planted by any or all of these people. This is pure supposition. I still move for a dismissal. Very well. I will take it under advisement. And it would appear that these five people have conspired to commit bodily harm. We'll get into it. Hey, gun! Him! Turner! <laughs> Immediately. Court is adjourned. You all right? Yeah. That man can't tell us anything. Maybe not. certainly was a case. Take a look at this. Any different issues of this magazine? No, but he has three copies of this one. Look, Perry, it's been a long night. This just about does it, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'd say we just have time enough to clean up for court. I now call Clark Hunter to the stand. Mr. Hunter... Have you heard of the drug end abuse? Yes, I've heard of it. It was given to you during your treatment for alcohol abuse. Yes, it was. Doctors give it to patients to prevent them from drinking. What happens when a patient who's taking end abuse drinks alcohol? He gets sick. Only a fool would take end abuse and drink. And I am not a fool. You know Western Liquors on Brand Boulevard, do you not? Yes. Do you have a charge account there? Yes, I do. On the day of the murder, you ask Weston Liquors to deliver a particular bottle of Burgundy to your house, did you not? I often order wines for professional gifts. You knew that Burgundy was Miss Jansen's favorite and that she was having a dinner party that night? That's two questions. So it is. You knew that particular wine was Miss Jansen's favorite? No. Did you know that she was having a dinner party that night? No. On the day before Miss Jansen's dinner party, the one you did not know about, did you purchase a syringe from Morton's Pharmacy? I don't remember. If I showed you a copy of your pharmacy bill, would that refresh your memory? Okay, so what if I did? Before you sent the wine to Miss Jansen... Didn't you dissolve end abuse tablets in a small bit of water and then inject it through the cork into the bottle? Absolutely not. On the day of the dinner, you left a package in Mr. Keene's office. Didn't you then call a messenger service to pick it up and deliver it to Ms. Jansen's home? Of course not. Your Honor. I'm through with this witness, Your Honor. But I reserve the right to recall. Witness may step down. I now call Judith Jansen to the stand. 
Ms. Jansen, do you recognize that bottle? Yes, it's my favorite burgundy. On the night Mr. Keene was murdered, you canceled the dinner party that he was invited to, did you not? Yes, I did. Why? Well, I had some of this burgundy that afternoon, and it made me so ill that I ended up in the emergency room at Good Shepherd Hospital. Defense Exhibit G, Your Honor, the doctor's report from Good Shepherd Hospital. The diagnosis is toxic poisoning. Ms. Jansen, you're certain it was that burgundy that made you ill? Well, I hadn't had anything else to eat or drink since breakfast. Where did you get the wine? It was delivered by the Monarch Messenger Service from Winslow. It's my favorite burgundy. I couldn't resist trying it. I always have a little wine when I cook. Just... Thank you, Ms. Jensen. I have no further questions. This witness may step down. Defense recalls Clark Hunter. Knowing she would cancel her dinner, you deliberately tried to make Judith Jensen ill. No, I did not. Do you know who placed that recorder and automatic dialer in Sheila Carlin's house? No, I don't. I did not. But you did maneuver Winslow Keene to be alone at home where your, your hired assassin killed him. Mr. Hunter, you did that, did you not? Mr. Hunter, did you not? That's preposterous. Your Honor, Mr. Mason is persecuting me. He's using innuendo, lies, half-truths. I have rights. I know my rights. Your Honor, I consider Mr. Mason to be a very dangerous man. This court should be very careful with him. This court is here to protect your rights, Mr. Hunter. Please continue, Mr. Mason. Mr. Hunter, you're aware of the American Freedom Network, are you not? I'm aware of it. Understatement, sir. You sit on the board of that organization. In fact, you are the chairman of the board. That's why I'm aware of it. By the way, the man who was accidentally shot here yesterday, Paul Turner, you knew him, did you not? Of course I did not know him. The American Freedom Network also runs the survivalist camp, does it not? We provide the opportunity for Americans who love their country to prepare themselves to defend it. Isn't it true that for the past five years, Paul Turner was the head instructor at that camp? It's possible. And it's very possible that Turner broke into Dr. Carlin's house first to frighten her, then later to rig that recording machine? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. I call your attention to Defense Exhibit K. Still photos taken from the surveillance cameras here in the courtroom yesterday during the shooting. Can you find yourself in those photos, Mr. Hunter? No. No. Of course not. You'll note that while everyone in the courtroom is looking at Mr. Turner... You were going out the side door, that side door. So what? So, you were the man he was looking for. You were his target. You were the only one who knew that. Your Honor, Defense Exhibit L, a sworn statement from Doris Lester, a friend of Mr. Turner's. Mr. Markham is the most literate man in this court today. I'd like to ask him to read the highlighted section for us. Uh, Your Honor, this is hardly... Mr. Markham. Well, uh, uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Turner got a call from someone, someone he said hired him to kill a man named Keene. When he heard he wasn't getting his money, he took this gun out of the display case and went to the courthouse to shoot him. He said he'd kill him with the gun that man had given him. Your Honor, 
We'd like to enter into evidence defense exhibit Q, this display case from Paul Turner's apartment. It contained the sidearm of General George McAuliffe, a famous World War II general. Do you recognize it, Mr. Hunter? No, I don't. You should, Mr. Hunter. It contained the gun Mr. Turner brought into court, the gun you had given him. Here is the name of a gun store in Chicago. The store has a record of the purchase order signed by you, even has your fingerprints on it. Now, would you like to tell the truth, your truth, Mr. Hunter? Winslow Kane wanted to silence me. Keep me from telling American people the truth. Would you speak up, sir? Winslow Kane wanted to silence me. Keep me from telling the American people the truth. I couldn't let him do that. And you had him killed. I did what I had to do. So, you are the dangerous man, Mr. Hunter. You are the dangerous man. Mr. Markham? The people move for dismissal. Bailiff, take the witness into custody immediately. This case is dismissed and court is adjourned. Oh, thank you for being my friend. <laughs> no need. I'd like a rematch sometime. Oh. Mr. Markham, we're bound to meet again. Care to join us for lunch? He's buying. What a shame. Not today, <laughs> thanks. Oh, Sheila, have you told Perry yet? I'm, uh, I'm starting a clinic for battered women and their children. Wonderful idea. We were talking about... We were talking about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. How can I ever repay you? You just did. Goodbye, P.M. P.M. Mm -hmm. P.M. Mm -hmm. Pre-med, post-mortem, past master, <laughs> past midnight. Yeah, past midnight. Uh, oh, not another... No, this isn't tea. I made you a fresh pot of cocoa. Cocoa? Mm -hmm. Cocoa? I haven't had cocoa since I was a boy. So? So? Mm -hmm. I've been waiting a long time. Murder, She Wrote, next on Hallmark Channel. Make yourself at home. Making any progress, Novak? This is the seventh homicide with the same M.O. How do you catch a killer? Let's talk about evidence. What have we got? No one can ID him. When the killer is hunting you... You can't even protect your own pretty little wife. ...at 30,000 feet. He's on the plane. Johnny's gone. David James Elliott. It has clearly become personal. Baby, baby, baby! Code 1114 premieres tomorrow night at 9 on Hallmark Channel. Viacom.